Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, we finished off before the break what remained of a quick summarized version of the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam and the stories with a point uh, to show the whole concept of sabr, patience. And don't think sabr is where you're being inactive or lazy or doing nothing. Absolutely not. Sabr is one of the hardest things to do. It's, um, it's like, for example, it's easier to move than to stay still. Okay? You know, if I got told, right, keep moving, keep moving, now stand still. Now, for me to maintain this posture exactly like that for, a, for longer is difficult. It's easier to just move and relax. So patience, if you understand it like that, is harder than to react. Rea reacting is easier. Somebody slaps you in the face, it's easier to get angry and want to go for that person. That's easier because that's your fitrat. That's your nature. That's natural. Someone slaps you and for you to keep calm, that is harder. Okay? Someone uses obscenities at you, uh, says some foul language at you, and you don't use foul language back. That's harder. That's more difficult. It's easier to just say back what that person has said. So please don't think that patience is doing nothing. Patience is managing and believing in Allah, believing in His plan, and accepting His plan. Anyway, I did say that I was going to not do any more stories, otherwise nobody's going to phone in. Please do call on 01274 214299. That's 01274 214299. Let me jump on some questions from our various groups. Let's go to the gents group first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti Saab, is it necessary for the newlywed bride to move into the husband's house after marriage? Or would it also be permissible for the husband to move into the wife's house if there is more space to accommodate for the newlywed couple? Or perhaps a better environment for them to live in there rather than at the husband's house? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, from a Shari perspective, it is the husband's responsibility to provide a house for the wife. That's from a Shari traditional perspective. Therefore, if he moves into his wife's house or his wife's family's house, then he's not fulfilling that right. Uh, unless his wife waives that right and says, you don't need to provide uh, a house for me or provide accommodation for me. That is why usually what happens is that the house where the husband is living, whether he is living in his own house or whether he is living in a shared accommodation with his parents, then he becomes responsible to provide for his wife. We do see, obviously, nowadays in some families where the sons do live with their parents. And when the son does get married, the wife moves in with the son, which is in the parents' home. So you could argue, technically speaking, it's her in-laws that are providing for it. But by extension, the son is part of the in-laws, and if the father has given some kind of ijazah, then that is absolutely fine. So that's why it's strange to say, and not fulfilling the shari'i right of accommodation by the husband if the man moves into the woman's apartment or the woman's shared accommodation. Assalamu alaikum. I understand at the beginning of Surah Tawbah we don't recite Bismillah. However, if a person has started the Surah and other few ruku, he finishes there the following day he starts. Can he now recite Bismillah or for this Surah we never recite Bismillah regardless of where we start from? Miswak. Is it necessary to do Miswak whilst doing Wudu or due to ease can one do it any time before Salah whilst not necessarily doing Wudu? Whilst doing Miswak a lot of saliva drops on my clothes. Would this have an impact on anything? The main question here is, to, is Miswak specific to wudu or can one do it 15, 20 minutes before doing wudu? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If a person starts reciting his normal uh, tilawa at this particular surah, uh, then yes, he can recite basmallah. Uh, there's no harm in it because he's not reciting it for the purpose of the surah. He's re reciting it because it is the beginning of his reci recitation. Uh, with regards to miswak, it is not necessary. It is just according to the Hanafi, we associate the miswak with wudu, whereas according to some other madhaib, especially the Shafi, they associate miswak with salah. So we say uh, the time you cleanse and rinse your mouth, that is the time you also make miswak. 
um, I don't understand why uh, you would say that a lot of saliva drops on your clothes whilst making me swag. If you're leaning forward, I don't understand the problem there. Surely when you're brushing your teeth with uh, toothpaste, there's more chance of something dripping on your clothes. And that seems not to be a problem. And then, so I'm not, so I'm not sure where you're going with that, brother. Um, so um, there should be no issues at all. Um, Assalamu alaikum. What's up? If an apple falls on the ground and there is for a long time that it rots and ferments, can it be considered just to touch? Waalaikumsalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brother, you're. <laughs> You're analyzing things just too much. Uh, goodness me, you know. Um, if an apple falls on the ground, is there a long time it rots and ferments? Can it be considered just to touch? Uh, I doubt it. Apple is not going to ferment like that. Uh, so, and normally you wouldn't probably pick an apple up that's rotting anyway with your bare hands. Uh, you probably put a glove on or get a litter picker or something like that. Okay, what's this? Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Mufti sahab, mene rabi ul awal mehne mein kuch kaam apne upar lazim kar liya hai. He's, he's writing Urdu in English, so, which is always interesting. Farz wajib sunnat samjhe baghair. Aaj chand raat se rozana panch hazar durood sharif uh, pa dunga kasm, kasme ka, uh, kam se kam is mehne mein. Parunga, okay. Aaj se rozana sirat ka muthala karunga. Aaj se rozana teen, teen sunnate seekunga. Okay. Kam se kam is mehne me peer jumerat ka roza rakunga. Ye sub kam to nek he. Magar iske liye koi khas mehne se shuru karna kya ye bidat to nahi hoge. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. اگر آپ کا ذہن یا ایسے سوچ ہے کہ اس لیے کہ میں یہ ربی الاول میں کر رہا ہوں تو اس کی وجہ سے مجھے اور زیادہ سوا مل جائے گی تو یہ پھر غلط ہے پھر بدت ہے لیکن اگر آپ ایسے بس مہینے کو ربی الاول بس شروع ہو گیا یہ نہیں کہ آپ کوشش کر رہا تھا کہ میں ربی الاول میں ایسے پڑھنا تو پھر اس میں کوئی حرج نہیں ہے اس لیے کہ آپ بس وقت کے لیے یہ مہنے کو استعمال کر رہا ہے یہ نہیں کہ آپ ایسے سوچ کر رہے کہ اس مہنے میں خصوصیت ہے یا اس مہنے میں بہت ثواب ہے اگر ایسے ہے تو آپ کو پھر دلیل کو ڈوننا پڑے گا تو اس میں اگر آپ نے ایسے کیا تو اس بھی یہ بدت نہیں ہوگی لیکن اگر آپ اتنے آپ پر ڈال رہا ہے تو کہیں نے مشکل بھی ہوگی تو آپ سوچ کر جب آپ ایسے کر رہا ہے کہ میں اپنے آپ کو اوپر کوئی لازم کر رہا ہے تو آسان کوئی چیز کر لو پہلے اس کے بعد تھوڑے سے بر کر لو سو فار دوز ہو ڈونٹ انڈرسٹینڈ انگلش وین واٹ دا بردر واز آسکنگ is that in the month of Rabi al-Awwal, which has started, um, he wanted to make binding upon him um, the following, that uh, every day he would recite 5,000 durood sharif, okay, every day. And uh, also he would study the seerat of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam every day. And every day he would find three sunnats. And also in Peer and Jumirat, he would fast. Okay, Mondays and Thursdays, he would fast. So he then asked that, is this okay to do like this or is this a bidat? So I said, if you think that you will get extra reward because it is in Rabi al-Awwal, then yes, it's a bidat. Because there's no dalil for that. But if you're just doing it because you're just using Rabi al-Awwal as a month, to say, oh, I'll do it for this month, but I don't expect any extra reward, I just, I'm free this month, or whatever, then there's no harm in it. One shouldn't think that, uh, you know, it helps if you actually reply. Oh, no, I've replied to him. I was just wondering, you should, you know, why haven't I replied? Uh, one shouldn't think, okay, that um, because it's Rabi al-Awwal, oh, I'm going to get more reward. You have to have the lil for that. You have to have evidence for that. Assalamu alaikum, Mufsab. I've heard from brothers that dua that is made in the position of sujood is readily accepted since this is the position wherein a mu'min is closest to their Rabb. Is there any basis for this practice mentioned in that hadith of Nabi alayhi salatu salam or is it wrong to practice upon this? Also, often I hear that brothers even make dua in languages other than Arabic whilst in the sajjahs of salah. As far as I know, to any word of any language which is required of salah would nullify the salah or is that some sort of allowance for duas to be made in the posture of sajjah during salah even in Arabic or other languages? 
Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, it is sound to make dua in sajda. There is no harm. There is uh, a, you know, there is a uh, precedent in the narrations. So there's nothing wrong upon that at all. Uh, but one should re refrain and restrict themselves only on the Arabic language and not go beyond the Arabic language. Um, so that should be avoided. Outside of Salah, yes, one can say anything, even if one went fell into sajda. They didn't, you know, into, just fell into sajda and started crying to Allah and saying, I beg your forgiveness, oh Allah, grant me. You know, sometimes naturally a person falls into sajda. Uh, you know, they're in a very difficult moment. Then there's no harm in that. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Fasab. Would a company be allowed to take out VAT from customers or should a Muslim wanting to start up a business avoid this? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you set up a business in the UK and obviously your turnover is of a certain amount, then you have no choice but to charge VAT. And obviously as a consequence, you can then claim back VAT. Uh, so these are laws uh, that are binding upon someone uh, based in the UK. So they would have to adhere to them to obviously avoid tax, uh, not legally. This is obviously not legally avoiding tax to, uh, uh, to do, uh, um, find ways to reduce tax for yourself. That's not a problem. There are legal loopholes and there are legal systems where a person can arguably exploit uh, for their own benefit in order to avoid giving tax, but to not pay tax. Uh, to to say I'm not going to, then obviously that's problematic, it's illegal, and therefore one doesn't really have a choice when they're in business and they're earning a certain amount of money. So that covers the uh, brothers group. So if you do have any more questions, please do call in. Um, let's go across to the sisters group. Uh, and let's see what's left on the sisters group. We have, there you go. Salam Ustaji, I wanted to know if stoned meat is halal to eat. Do Hanafis allow it? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, depends what animal is stunned. Um, if it is a large animal uh, and it is single stunning, then yes, like a lamb, a sheep. Uh, but if it is a small animal like hens, and they are stunned in a water bath, then there are problems. I've done research on this. Please go to www.irtis.org.uk. That's www.irtis.org.uk. And if you search under research fatawa, I think you will find something on water bath stunning. Okay. Um, and please read that in great detail. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you and your family are fine, inshallah. I've heard from some people that they don't pluck their eyebrows because it's haram, but bleach the eyebrows to make them look the same. Is it allowed to dye the eyebrows like this? And if you have uh, very full eyebrows and sometimes a single hair sticks out, can you pluck or otherwise cut it a little bit so that it doesn't stick out or is that also haram? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If a, a lady has thick eyebrows, large eyebrows, and she wants to kind of minimize the size of them, and she feels by bleaching bits of it, it will look like her skin color and therefore not look like hair, then there's nothing wrong with that as such, um, because the mas'ala is about removing plucking, and she's not doing that. Secondly, if you have exceptionally thick eyebrows, which also meet in the middle, uh, and very thick eyebrows, then there is some permissibility. And I say this with a lot of uh, disclaimers and a lot of hesitation because, you know, the famous saying is, you give an inch and someone takes a mile. Uh, and that is obviously that they may remove just that little bit directly above the bridge of the nose. And if they're exceptionally bushy and they're sort of like, you know, falling into the eyes or whatever, they may trim them back a little bit. Uh, but really, uh, they should avoid too much because you know what happens, you look in the mirror and you think, okay, I'll just clip that a little bit. Oh, okay, I'll clip it on that side a little bit. Oh, okay, I'll clip it on this side a little bit. And before you know it, you've got thin lines, okay? It's like, you know, men with their beards. You know, they look in the mirror and they think, okay, I'll just clip it a little bit there. Okay, clip a little bit there, clip a little bit there, clip a little bit there. And, you know, you've like lost half your beard. Happens even to me when I go to the uh, barbers. It's just that I don't go to the barbers that often now, but when I used to go to the barbers, I used to say, look, 
grab my beard and anything outside of my beard, outside of my beard, anything outside of your fist, just clip back. So he'd say, no problem. And then he's just cl 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 clipping away. And you know, your face is up. You're not even looking in the mirror because you have to have your chin up. So he'd say, Bhai sahab, he'd just say, you know, look what I told you. Just, just outside the handful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when he stands you up, you know, he's like trimmed your beard right back. And he think, you know, what have you just done? And he says, like you told me. I said, I never told you to do this. So yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit ruthless. So you have to be very careful. Uh, can the link to the fatwa on drop shipping be sent? Again, I've searched it, we can't seem to find it. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just had a quick question. Are we allowed to wear baggy pants in front of our mahrams? Um, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, absolutely so, yeah. Uh, if it does not disclose the woman's body, especially for a woman with in front of a mahram, it will be above her knee. Because uh, below her knee, she can show to a mahram. It will be above her knee. So as long as it does not give the, her figure, then there should be no problem. Obviously, that depends on the shape of the woman. Uh, this won't apply to every woman. Sometimes women are, I don't know even how best to describe it, but I'll leave that to you to work out. Some women are such that if they wear baggy trousers, it's all good. But some women are such, even when they wear baggy trousers, because of the shape of their body, uh, it's just one can still determine, uh, you know, the what's what, basically. So that gets us to the end of that. Alhamdulillah, as always, mashallah, alhamdulillah, it gets us to the end. And we have three minutes to spare. So let me just see uh, that I have not missed anything out. I don't think I have. So that means, alhamdulillah, a job well done, if I don't mind me saying. Tomorrow, there won't be a live session uh, because uh, my colleague uh, Adil is going to Ingumim. Ah, he's going Birmingham. So he's going Birmingham down to the Brummies, uh, down to the Midlands, doing some filming. And then on Saturday, he is in Preston. Whoa, 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 scratch that. He's in Bolton on Saturday. And on Sunday, and, and Sunday, where are you Sunday, Adil? He's nowhere on Sunday. I don't mean that in the country, no way, meaning he's back home. So Bolton uh, on Saturday and Birmingham on Friday, and it is for the special uh, Pakistan floods appeal. And then next week on Friday, he's heading to Leicester. On Saturday, he's in Saturday he's in Ilford, and Sunday, he's in Slough. Okay, so he's a busy, busy boy these next two weekends, getting enough mileage done, but oh, he drives a nice car. Alhamdulillah, I'm sure he doesn't mind. I'm sure he doesn't mind the mileage in that car. I guess if he was driving my car, my car, my little, can not speak English? I guess if he was driving my car, he might not enjoy the drive as much, but I've seen his car, alhamdulillah, may Allah put barakah in it, may Allah protect it from nazar. Uh, so therefore, I'm sure he won't mind driving that, all these uh, hundreds of miles he's going to do. But anyway, please do tune in for those appeals, those live appeals that will be taking place on the two Fridays, this Friday and next Friday, and over the weekend as well. Only Saturday this week, but next week, Saturday, Sunday. As for me, I will return, inshallah, next week, Wednesday, same time, same place, same hour, same things, questions and answers. No questions today at all, so you've got no answers. Oh, okay, maybe slightly different. We've got the questions on the uh, two forums that I have on there. And they also got the answers on those two forums as well. Uh, so nicely rounded up. End of the week, alhamdulillah. Uh, tomorrow, obviously, still madrasa, but it's end of the week for my Q&A on Ikra TV till Wednesday. Don't forget, send the rood upon Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I'll see you all next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.